Good evening, friends. My name is Danny Avula, uh, and I am with the, the, on behalf of the Board of Trustees for the Richmond Memorial Health Foundation, uh, we are so pleased that you guys would choose to spend uh, your evening here with us. Uh, I know that all of us are busy people with busy lives. I, in fact, am supposed to be at my, uh, I help coach my, my kids' basketball team. So uh, that's where I should be tonight, but if any of you have watched seven and eight-year-olds learn how to play basketball recently, uh, you will appreciate my enthusiasm about being here instead. Uh, so I, the, tonight is gonna be amazing. Uh, the, the Bridge Memorial Health Foundation has really been uh, on a, a great journey this past year in, in thinking about um, how we need to approach health uh, differently and how we need to think about uh, how do we really move forward a culture of health in the Richmond region. Uh, and and the, the trustees over the last year have really wrestled with that question and uh, done a lot of thinking and reading and connecting, uh, and, and even in the process adopted a new mission to really foster uh, an equitable and healthy Richmond region. Uh, and in that journey, uh, we uh, have done a lot of work with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and so there's no one really that we can think of uh, who's better suited to, to challenge us and inspire us uh, than Dr. Jim Marks, who you're going to hear from. Um, and along with that, uh, some of the work that Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has done with us at, at the Richmond Memorial Health Foundation and in the city of Richmond um, has had to do with the intersection of conversations that need to happen to advance a culture of health. How is it that the healthcare system works with education, with planning and housing and economic development? How do all those different pieces of local government and the nonprofit sector and, and the private sector come together to do this work? Uh, and one of the amazing, exciting things that's happening right now is the change in leadership that we're seeing. Uh, and, and here in Richmond tonight, uh, we've got Mayor LeVar Stoney, who is here and, uh, and is so committed to this concept of a culture of health. Already, he really... <laughs> He really understands what it takes to bring those pieces together. And so, Mayor LeVar Stoney, thank you for being here and, and welcoming us tonight. Thank you. Let's give another round of applause to Dr. Danny Avula. Yeah. Danny, I was singing your praises the other night to Commissioner Marissa Levine about all the great work and having you as a partner uh, in improving the quality of life of children here in the city. So thank you for everything you've done. I also appreciate you being here, Dr. Marks, as well. Uh, looking forward to hearing your remarks. Unfortunately, I will have to run out. I'm on politician time. <laughs> and so I apologize for my tardiness and my uh, sneaking out of here uh, as well. Uh, I saw Madam Vice President Dr. Cynthia Newell is here as well. Round of applause to her. In the back, I don't know what's going on. And the Richmond Memorial Health Foundation trustees who are here as well, thank you all for uh, this opportunity too. As Danny said, I believe that we are at a pivotal moment in Richmond's history. That's right. We have such great opportunities that lie before us. Uh, but I think in order to get to that next level, it's going to take what I believe is called radical collaboration, working, working together across disciplines, not only inside City Hall, but working with our partners, whether they're in the private sector, the nonprofit world, or the philanthropic world, to bring the resources to bear to improve the quality of life of children in our city. Uh, I talk every single day about building one Richmond, not nine Richmonds, because we have nine city council districts, or not two Richmonds, but building one Richmond, one Richmond that every child, every individual who lives in the city limits has an opportunity to succeed. And this, for me, is about bringing individuals off the margins and out of the shadows and recognizing them for who they are and giving them a, a, a culture of great public health, great public education, a safe city with affordable housing right here in the city limits here in Richmond. This, to me, is about not only numbers, there's 220,000 or so people who live in the city of Richmond, but this, I heard described for me the other day, is about it's about our babies. It's about our young people. There are 40% of our children in this city who live on the poverty line. To me, that is a reason to come to work every single day and be dissatisfied. Dissatisfied every single day until we start bringing that number, 40% and 26% of just individuals overall, 
Until we start bringing that number down, we can't be satisfied with our progress. To me, change is just a word without progress. And so for me, I'm gonna not only just challenge the people inside City Hall about how, we be, how are we better than the, when we were the day before, or the week before, or the month before, or the year before, but also I wanna challenge our partners. I wanna challenge our, our friends in the healthcare community, our friends in public education, our friends in the nonprofit world. How are we as a city better than what we were last year, last month, or yesterday? That's what we have to do it, and we have to do it together. Um, just blocks from here, there are monuments that uh, recognize our past as a, as a city. A past that I know that some of us aren't too proud of. But when I think about the future of the city of Richmond, I think about the monuments that we can build together. The monuments that we can build towards the victories that we're gonna win the victories we're gonna win in improving public health for every child in the city. The victories were on public education. The victories on affordable housing. To me, those are all within our grasp. But it's gonna take more than some person with a fancy title, the honorable or mayor. It's gonna take people from all disciplines, all walks of life, coming together as one to get the job done. And so I appreciate you, Dr. Marks, and your work over at uh, Robert Wood Johnson and what they've done for the city of Richmond thus far. Well, I'm gonna tell you this. Me and people like Danny are continuing to ask and ask and ask <laughs> because we have babies dependent on us. And it's just, it's just something we just gotta do. So I appreciate you being here with us tonight and hope you're enjoying the great city of Richmond. Thank you guys so much. Mayor Stoney, thank you for your commitment to make one Richmond characterized by equity and opportunity for all people. And we realize how busy you are, and even though you're politician time, we're on your calendar and your watch, so that <laughs> means a lot. My name is Mark Constantine, and I have the genuine honor and pleasure to serve as the CEO of the Richmond Memorial Health Foundation. And I just would like to start this evening with a few thanks. No ass, Dr. Marks, just a few thanks. I'd like to thank Danny Avula and the extraordinary trustees of the foundation. It's the trustees who have the vision and the commitment to have us here this evening and to make our vision of creating an equitable and healthy Richmond region one that we can live into. So I do need to acknowledge our trustees and thank you. One of the things that distinguishes Richmond and makes it a truly exceptional place are the women and men every day who labor in our nonprofit sector all too often, we don't acknowledge them, we don't lift their voices up, and we don't show the respect that they are deserving. Mm -hmm. So in this room tonight, you have many of the past, present, and hopefully future grantees of the Richmond Memorial Foundation. Your work makes our city so much better, so thank you. Um, I will need and want desperately to acknowledge the RMHF staff. We are small in number, but mighty in spirit and aspiration. <laughs> and you can imagine I had nothing to do with making tonight as wonderful as it is. Um, as Danny noted, we began this year with a deep commitment to fostering an equitable and healthy Richmond region. And we have invited 18 courageous women and men to join us in that journey. So tomorrow, 18 RMHF Health and Equity Fellows will begin a process of defining our agenda with and for us. Their names are listed on the back of the brochures. If you have a chance to talk with them, please do. They're remarkable and extraordinary, and we're going to be better as a foundation and as a city because of them. And finally, I get the great pleasure of introducing Dr. Jim Marks. Dr. Marks serves as the Executive Vice President of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and for many years has overseen the culture of health strategy that the foundation has employed that Dr. Avula mentioned. He's been a leader in public health for 35 years. There's lots of amazing things you can say about Dr. Marks, but I hear the three that I think are important. He's compassionate, he's committed, 
and he's fierce. <laughs> and so with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jim Marks to the Richmond community. Well, it's a real pleasure for me to be here, and I'm honored uh, that Mayor Stoney would, uh, would come to uh, open this uh, meeting uh, up. Um, I'm also uh, honored to have had uh, Danny and Mark uh, introduce me, and I got to meet them and the board uh, today. Uh, it was really great to be asked to uh, hear the journey that uh, uh, the foundation has been on because it has paralleled our own journey. Uh, we are we started with the culture of health just a few uh, years ago and have come to a very different place than we used to be uh, as a foundation and what we think it takes to make a uh, make our nation healthier but also to make it just a better place to live learn, work, and play. Uh, the mayor uh, basically told you the story of where we're going. Um, he wants to have this city be better every day. Uh, we need the nation to be better uh, every day. And one of the things that got us thinking how to have that happen was the fact that while we were getting better, we were losing ground relative to the rest of the world. So that um, when you look at developing nations, we have a shorter life expectancy, and we are much more costly in our health care system. Uh, and how do we turn that around? We also, I should say, have greater uh, inequities. The mayor talked about safety. Um, we've done a lot of work in childhood obesity. Early on, we brought uh, community groups and some parents together, and we asked them about taking their kids out, letting their kids go out to play. And they said they didn't. They didn't feel their neighborhood was safe. These were people from low-income neighborhoods. So they couldn't do that. They wouldn't do that. They didn't feel comfortable uh, doing that. So if we are saying for kids to uh, get healthy, they need to be active, and parents didn't feel safe, all of a sudden we found an area we'd made a lot of commitment to and saw as a serious issue for our, our nation bumped up against this other issue. These were uh, connected. He talked about uh, affordable housing. Um, that's another area, and I'll touch on that, that we've started uh, to look at. And I know we've got some members of the Federal Reserve Bank here. We started to work uh, with uh, them as well. Now, we know how important housing is for a family, but it's also important for health. About, uh, estimates are that about 30 to 40 percent of asthma in children is related to the characteristics of their housing, whether it's damp, whether it's cold, whether it's uh, infested with um, mites, cockroaches, uh, etc. <coughs> so uh, when we think of housing, we can think that housing and health are linked, uh, and in fact, Almost all of the things that are important in our society are linked. So I really want to uh, honor and thank you as well for coming here because you are leaders for Richmond, but from many different sectors uh, in uh, this uh, community. Um, I, I'll, I'm going to take you down a little bit of our journey before getting into where we are now starting to go. I want to emphasize uh, three issues. Um, and I hope to end in enough time so we can have some good uh, dialogue. First is that of equity, health equity. When we started to look at where our nation needed to go, where our communities uh, needed to go, equity came to the top, and I'll tell you why. Though one of the easiest ways to tell that story are the maps that Steve Wolf at VCU has done for us from the beginning, and I know he's done one for Richmond and is even looking now at the greater Richmond area, which shows large differences in life expectancy just a few miles apart. And Richmond's maybe a little better than some places, but we know in many cities um, that uh, often the neighborhoods closest to our best hospitals are those that are doing the most poorly with their health. So it's not just access to health care, but in fact is much more uh, than that. Uh, the second is that it has to happen everywhere if we're talking about a culture of health. That is, if we do a demonstration program in one neighborhood or one community, or three or nine communities, but it doesn't spread, our work, 
the work of researchers, the work of those trying this special uh, demonstration is ultimately sterile. If we start something, show it works, and it doesn't spread to those at great need, it does not help our nation overall. And on the flip side, if those of you who are working in communities and doing your best and seeing the problems every day don't have behind you the science and the evidence that if you do this, it will work, your work also runs the risk of being sterile. It is that marriage between what we learn in our research and what we need to do in communities that really causes uh, our work to bear, uh, bear uh, fruit. So I've told you about the interdependence between research and action on the ground. I've told you about the interdependence between work like in childhood obesity and the safety of neighborhoods. I've told you that as we looked at affordable housing and the importance of that for health, for we needed to engage with the Federal Reserve uh, banks and with, the, with HUD. The second, or the, sorry, the third key theme is interdependence. No important problem of our time, health problem or other problem, can be solved by any one sector alone. It won't be solved by health care alone, by public health alone, by the Richmond Memorial Health Foundation alone, or by our foundation alone. If we are serious about the serious problems, we're going to have to uh, create and make partnerships uh, together in ways we never have before. So again, I am really honored that so many of you would come here from different sectors, uh, leaders from different sectors in uh, Richmond. So let me tell you a little bit about our foundation and how we came to the place that uh, Richmond Memorial Health Foundation is. We're a large uh, foundation. We're the largest in the U.S. dealing solely with health and health care domestically. Um, we have done work in helping to set up the 911 call system around the nation. We've done a lot of work in tobacco and quality of health care and fairly recently major investments in our work in childhood obesity and trying to uh, turn that around. A few years ago we had our 40th anniversary and it was a time as you might expect of celebration. But we knew afterwards we would also need to take stock. Where would we go next? That discussion and with our board, with outside people, with our staff, got us to, this, to the conclusions that I just uh, uh, foreshadowed for you. That if we felt we were pretty successful as a foundation, but when we looked at where the nation was, the most costly, the poorest outcome, and we didn't cover everybody, and most of the other countries did, you'd have to say at a macro level we'd failed. And we as a nation had failed. We had to try different strategies if we wanted things to change, a different approach. And that got us into thinking about how are we going to move the nation as a whole and to see that all of these things were connected and that the decisions that we made as a nation became easier, that the work that we did together became something we expected and not an add-on. You're coming here to hear me after work for most of you, taking time from your family, even if it's a seven and eight-year-old <laughs> playing basketball. It's an add-on, and I appreciate that. And it, too many times we have to do it that way. That got us in thinking about we need to make it part of our culture. Our culture is about making our nation, our communities, Richmond, greater Richmond area, a better place to live, to raise a family, a healthier, safer place. And it turns out that those things that do that are good for our business community. They're good for our schools. Uh, they're good for really everything a community uh, is about. We needed to learn a lot uh, about uh, that. So the way we've started to think about it is health begins, it's strengthened, it's protected and preserved in our communities. Now, 
when we talk about the vision to build a culture of health, we've increasingly added the term well-being. Because in fact, so much that's important for health is really about well-being. I trained as a pediatrician, uh, so did Danny. And so I know uh, about health care. We in health care have tended to think that people want health itself, but they don't. They want a good life for their family, for their children, for those they care about. Health is an important base for that. I've got grandchildren. I want to see them grow up. I want to play with them. Um, maybe at my stage in life, I want to travel or volunteer, or perhaps I want to keep working. Maybe I need to, maybe I find it fulfilling. My best chance of having that kind of life is to watch what I eat. Don't smoke, exercise, get my flu shots. Healthcare is a base to give me my best chance, and it is for all of us, because that's the kind of life, it is a life that's fulfilling, and it's with warm relationships that we want for our families and in our communities. That's what our reflection on where we needed to go uh, uh, took us. I've touched on the U.S. situation. I'm not going to do more uh, about uh, that. Um, I will say there were some other elements that came to the fore for us, though, that I do want to touch on. Also, as we looked at our ability, our ability as a foundation to help galvanize that in communities around the nation, we also saw that often our most prominent leaders were acting in ways that were divisive, that we needed to help support leaders that saw that it wasn't the job of leaders to choose sides, but to bring sides together. And so we have completely transformed our fellowship programs so that while there's still fellowship programs for clinicians and for researchers and community leaders, they all have in it this notion of helping them become leaders that can work with others across boundaries, if you will. Now, I will say there's some selfishness in that, not just for our nation. We in philanthropy have no authority to do anything. We have precious little money to accomplish what needs to be accomplished. From that position of strength, we need to work <laughs> with all of you and with many others who are willing uh, to work uh, together. I touched on the issue of equity, and I'm going to do a little bit more about that. But I want to talk about it in connection with our embrace of what is in academic circles called the social uh, determinants of health. And I want to do that first by giving you a little bit of that context, and then a little bit about how we're framing it. So first of all, CDC, in looking at the factors that most influenced health, had the greatest impact. They created a pyramid. And the bottom two parts included things like changing the context, clean indoor air laws, taking trans fats out of food, things like that. The bottom part were social and environmental factors, like the issues of education, income, uh, racial uh, disparity, but also things like um, Transportation, part of the context, getting people being able to get uh, to work. Wikipedia defines these social factors as the economic and social conditions under which people live, which determines their health. Almost all the analyses indicate that it's those factors and the <coughs> consequences of them that are the source of much of our health and the differences between groups in our society. 80 to 90 percent, in fact. So that health care and the importance that health care uh, has for us uh, is really about 10 to 15 percent. Now, we know that talking about social determinants of health doesn't excite the public. And uh, we've had good experience not exciting the public. Uh, and uh, what we started to think about is what is it really? And I talked to you a little bit about 
it's really where people live, learn, work, and play. So it's the safety of your neighborhood. It's whether you can get fresh food there, fruits and vegetables. Uh, it is in their schools. Are they healthy places for our children? Not just do they learn reading, writing, and arithmetic, but they're active because that's where they spend so much of their day. That the food they get is uh, good for them. That when people go to work, the work is safe for them. That they feel good about the work uh, that they do, and it helps them have a good life. And then play, I'd already touched on the issue. We need children to be out and play, whether that's in parks or, or other uh, places. Think of those as the social determinants of health for uh, a community and how powerful uh, they are. We, in, in beginning to frame that, recognized that we needed to do much more uh, in, in our creation of partnerships. But what got us down this path about the time that we had done our, our um, relook at, 40th, at the 40th anniversary was in fact we had created a commission to build a healthier America. And we asked them to look at things that were outside of medical care. They mentioned schools. They mentioned the food deserts and safety and the local strength that people needed, the local capacity. They emphasized community development at the second commission. The first commission, we used the maps that Steve had. We talked about the fact that uh, it looked like the zip code that people lived in was more important to their health than their genetic code. The Federal Reserve Bank in San Francisco happened to see that report. And in a discussion, they said, well, we're actually in the zip code improving business. And started to say, and they created a whole issue of their journal on community development about health and community development. We didn't know about it. It got a lot of attention in the field, in the other federal banks, in the field as a whole. And they called us up and said, we'd like, we've been asked to have our national conference on the intersection between community development and health. Would you co-sponsor it with us? And we're a foundation. So we said, well, we're interested. How much will it cost? And they said, oh, we can't take any money, but we need your help in thinking who should come. And that set off a whole series of meetings, of different discussions, uh, you know, meetings with, where Ben Bernanke spoke at some of the conferences, Janet Yellen uh, in other, in other uh, regional uh, feds. I say that because I want you to see not that we were so strategic, but that we were fortunate, that others were listening to us, and we needed to listen and work with them. So we never would have thought of community development and the financing of affordable housing and things like that as a direction to go if they had not uh, reached out uh, to us. That also got us thinking, where else should we be looking? What else is going to be important for, for health and uh, that we had uh, missed? In our thinking about it, we also there was another area of science that had been developing that was coming to a real boiling point. And that was brain development and how in children, the stresses that are in families or the stresses that they directly feel can permanently change their brain so that they are less able to cope later on. Some of the early work was called the adverse childhood experiences. More recent work shows that that was things like child abuse, abuse of a parent, uh, alcoholic parent. The more you had of those in your upbringing, the more risks and really even diseases you would get at younger ages as adults. But they've also shown that even just the stress of growing up in a poor family where your housing is unstable, maybe your parents are feeling the stress of income instability and jobs, moving around a lot, changes a child's brain. We needed to tie these 
uh, together. On the flip side, in early childhood, we found that getting good daycare parenting, that mix in early life, meaning even under age three, began to be looked at for his kindergarten readiness, but it was really about social and emotional development. Did they share well? Could they focus on work in front of them? Did they have a, an ability to, uh, uh, to work uh, together? Uh, were they warm and talkative? and not just where they're getting academic uh, achievement. We also began to see the evidence was very clear. In young children, asthma is the leading cause of absenteeism. So if you don't do well because of poor health, you don't do well in school. School itself turns out to be a big predictor of length of life. So about every extra year of school a person has, they live a year longer. That's huge. That's huge. Steve helped us summarize that data, Steve Wolf. But let me give you an example to give you context. If we did away with deaths from cancer, it would save us between three and four years. We would gain three to four years of life expectancy. So going from high school to graduating from college is better for our society at life expectancy than doing away with cancer. Who would have thought it? We, in the health field needed to partner with the education field. And because education, almost more than any other, builds on itself. So the skills that come in the earliest years are needed for those that come in the next years and the next, whether that's in math and reading or working together, we needed to start at the earliest ages. And that's now an area of, of priority uh, for us. So that book, that some of you, if you're of my generation, maybe a little bit younger, might have read everything I needed to know I learned in kindergarten was much truer than we uh, thought at that uh, time. Um, I'm gonna mention a third but very quick area of research that ties all of this together. There are more and more science now. As the healthcare system is saying, is being told and is adjusting to what they call alternate payment uh, models or value-based purchasing. They're having to, they can't just keep uh, doing it as volume care, the numbers of admissions, the numbers of visits, they are in charge of the overall health of their patients. The data is getting clearer and clearer. So like in heart failure, one of the places they're gonna be evaluated or are being evaluated on the readmissions when a person gets discharged from a hospital, what proportion get readmitted within 30 days? It turns out that, depending on the study, a third to half are related to the income and social circumstances of the patients. In asthma and children, we see the same thing. So what, it's not that the doctors are responsible for the social circumstances, but their care, no matter how good they are, their, how they're judged relates as much to the patients they see and the circumstances of those patients uh, than it does to the quality of their care. So for our health care systems, some of the most innovative are starting to look at how they can change the communities in which they operate. So one of the insurers, United Health, one of the largest insurers, is in a pilot way investing in housing in uh, Arizona to see can by creating supportive housing, housing uh, that connects people to the healthcare system, can that help lower our costs? They're working with the community development uh, uh, field. Um, we're seeing others look at that and things like that as well. Humana is looking at what they can do community-wide, they've got a large market share. What I hope you're seeing is this confluence of forces and directions uh, as a, uh, that we are uh, heading as a nation. I think where you are thinking of going, you've chosen just the right time. So, uh, I, I told uh, Mark and others, tomorrow I go to the National Academy of Medicine, the Institute of Medicine. They just released a report two weeks ago on what communities can do to improve health equity. They've 
nine community studies. All of these are in progress, uh, nine community efforts. Some are focusing on one area or another. That report, even though there's no hard copy, had 2,500 downloads in the first week, 1.9 million social media impressions. Tomorrow they're having a group of constituents come in to talk about that report and where they go next. The Institute of Medicine, National Academy of Medicine, they're changing their name to be one of the other academies, is going to add health equity as part of their mission. They never had that uh, before. They had done some earlier reports saying, could we, should we be including social circumstances in our electronic health records? You may not have known that in the ICD codes, there is a code for poverty and extreme poverty, poverty affecting the ability to get food, poverty affecting housing. Those were there. They haven't been used. What else should we be um, looking at? Um, we knew as soon as we started our work in childhood obesity, we weren't going to be able to turn that epidemic around by just asking pediatricians to do better counseling of parents. We needed the schools. We needed supermarkets in the food deserts. We needed parks. We needed sidewalks. We needed <coughs> business and industry to create healthier foods for, uh, that people could, uh, could uh, purchase. I can go on and on. You may have heard that in Ben Carson's testimony, he quoted one of our reports on the link between housing and health. So we are seeing more and more opportunities to connect different sectors with us in health. You are thinking the same way. But we also have to recognize, I just said remember, that health isn't what people want. These sectors have their own purposes. We have got to help them see that if they work with us and we with them, we will both have a better chance of accomplishing our mission together. We are interdependent as a society. Richmond, you have lots of strengths. You are the state capital. That is often a place where some of the leaders in other sectors, whether it's banking uh, or others, where the, where the state health department is. You have a university with a medical school that already has some strong interest uh, in uh, this uh, area. You've got a good size. You're not so big that it's really hard for you to pull all of your leaders together, and you're not so small that you don't have the resources to begin to act. And you have a foundation that's willing to make uh, this uh, kind of uh, commitment. Um, you've got good diversity, and you should recognize the diversity of your people is a real strength. You've got a pretty good economy. Um, I could uh, go on there as well. You have engaged healthcare uh, institutions. You are part of a network that we're starting to uh, help connect together called Invest Health, where we, you, Richmond, have uh, successfully competed. You're one of 50 communities in roughly the same size range that will get together to learn from each other what they're trying to do and where they're succeeding in bringing groups together and creating the shared vision that we are all in this together, um, that health and well-being is what we want for our community, and that leaders across sectors are coming together. What we've seen elsewhere, so I had talked with the board earlier, uh, like in Oklahoma City, that uh, their business community lost the move of a company there because that company felt it could not get the kinds of executives it would need to come to Oklahoma City. One of the largest natural gas companies lost an executive they were recruiting because that executive's family did not want to move to Oklahoma City. They got with civic leadership and said, we need a better Oklahoma City. Now, Oklahoma City had a unique platform to build on. They would set a 1% sales tax that would sunset every five years. And they had to get a vote of the community, of the city, to pass it. And so they would be very explicit about what they do, or what they would do. And they created a case for parks. 
They created, they had a river that was often dry, that was a sort of ignored part of the city. They <coughs> dammed it up so it became always a river and it became a place for rowing. 50 businesses created rowing teams. They then created kayaking and they created training and teaching for the kids uh, there. They created another park in a low income area of the community and they donated a field for their, their semi-pro soccer team to practice. But the soccer team had to create clinics for the uh, children living in that uh, neighborhood and it has transformed the downtown. The mayor was worried that they could become a donut city, good suburbs and a hollowed out downtown. And he now feels that they have come an incredible way. They've, they've redone their sales tax for the same kinds of things uh, at least once and maybe twice. And uh, uh, the city is once more now the center of, of that region. Uh, we are hearing about this kind of work, uh, different institution leading it, the, uh, the hospital system in Spartanburg. We started to create a prize uh, 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 for communities of any size that are bringing together the leadership, bringing to creating that shared sense we're in it together, creating an increased equity for people to make the healthy choices. So when we think of equity, the first thing is we know that no philanthropic program, no government program will take the place of people making healthy choices for themselves and their families. But millions of people live in circumstances where the healthy choices are almost impossible to make. We've got to have a balance between what we need to do as the leaders in our community and for those that are in circumstances where it's very difficult uh, to, be, to become healthy. The other is, is in so far as possible, it means equity in health. Now I'm a physician and uh, I know that, I'm a pediatrician so this doesn't happen too often, but if someone comes to a physician with high blood pressure <coughs> and they're given a medication and it doesn't work as well as it should, they're given some more or an additional medication. They get what they need to do well. And we know that Doing well means getting down to what is normal, and in that in those instances, cholesterol, blood pressure, normal is the levels at which people live their longest, keep their health the longest. So the whole issue of treating people to a better place and giving them what they need as individuals is what we're now starting to see we need to do for our communities. And the third area of equity is one that I don't think we have given enough understanding and work and credence to. We need an equity of hope. People that are in the most <coughs> difficult circumstances, it's easy for them to lose hope. And what I, again, talked briefly to the board, there's actually been a randomized trial of an injection of hope. So in Oklahoma, women having a baby that were, and they, families were low income, some of them were given a $500 college fund, 529 plan. And that was a purpose that they could use it for. By age five, and some were not given that, just like you would do for a cancer drug, randomize, keep, uh, keep your distance and see what happened. By age five, those kids were doing better developmentally. That is, the kids whose mother got the $500 fund. The mothers were thinking differently about their future. They got hope. And those of you who've sent people to college, those of you who've gone to college, know that $500 is a drop in the bucket. But it was a, in the costs, but a big infusion of hope. That's what we're going to need as a nation. So I want to close because I, I could go on for quite a while. The board knows that already. Uh, fundamentally, this calls for a really transformative rethinking on how broad we think, broadly we think about how we improve health and well-being. We in health have acted as if good health is what people want. It isn't really. The narrowness in our thinking about health has greatly influenced our civic leaders and the public so that they have not been nearly as aware 
that how our society is organized, what our policies foster or inhibit, what our communities encourage, our institutions and businesses support, are equally fundamental causes of good or ill health, equally fundamental as the biologic ones. It is research that turns disease and injury from fate's misfortune or bad luck or accident into biologic understanding and potential control. But that research then turns its understanding over to society. And whether that's in clinical care or in community health or in education or in agriculture or almost anything, in the end, it's the policies and the laws and the practices, the scaffolding of our culture that must transform research into impact on disease and injury, improved health, improved equity. The policies and social structures inside clinical care and public health and outside and beyond the classic health field become part of the causal web relating perhaps to disease and injury itself but certainly to the distribution of that disease and injury in our people and communities. That is to the size and distribution of disparity and inequity. That's why we as a foundation felt we needed to embrace and help build with our nation, with partners, a culture of health. I will say, and talking to Mark and to the board, we embraced it with trepidation. We had never thought that way about what we could do, and I'm not sure we can, but we came away feeling that was really where we needed to help the nation go. So when Mark asked me to come down and talk to you and talk to the board, because of where the board here had come out in its discussions about how it would help the greater Richmond area, you know I had to come. There was just nothing else I could do. So I'm going to close there um, and happy to take questions or comments uh, and I'll let uh, Mark, you can tell me when the time uh, needs to end. Yes. Good evening, and thank you for your comments. My name is Greta Harris, and I run a community development organization that does service enriched affordable housing for about 3,000 mm. uh, families here in the greater Richmond area. It's a two part question. Uh oh. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna, a lot of good oh, well, I got to make sure I take notes then. All right. Uh, first, um, I think the mayor was right. We are at a great time for a different approach uh, for a different outcome for our community. Um, in the nonprofit world, collaboration, <coughs> big picture thinking, and organizational capacity is required for us to be a really meaningful partner for change. How do we make that case to our funders to support that type of growth so that we can those of us who are on the, the front line can, can be a better catalyst for outcomes that we all desire. And then the second part is you didn't utter the word race in your comments. Didn't I? I'm sorry. Because no. <laughs> I think of that as a central issue. Well, and, well I think it is. <laughs> and and the, you, you mentioned equity multiple times. But race and the underlying um, thread of racism that being below the Mason-Dixon line, being here in Richmond, uh, is, is permeating under the surface of so much uh, of the opportunity that we all want. And, and how do you balance that as you try to, to really promote the interdependency that is required for success? So I, I appreciate, I especially appreciate the second point that you made, if the, the, you couldn't hear, she, um, uh, called out that I did not mention race, and I please I want you all to realize that that was an oversight. When we talk about inequity, race is a central issue for our nation, for our society. We have to recognize that. And it's tied up with inequity on income. It's tied up with inequity on education. It's tied up with racial 
uh, well, with uh, segregation, residential segregation. These are all uh, connected. We have, as a nation, the advantage of probably having the most diverse population, but it's only an advantage if we make that work. And when we talk about inequity, why we talk about race, why we talk about uh, income and education is because it affects everything. These are all the, they, it's, so if I'm interested in asthma differences, I've got to think about race. If I'm interested in infant mortality, I've got to. If I'm interested in education, I've got to. All of these things are connected. And it is probably the most serious thing we have as a, as a nation. And we have not done well. We maybe have done better, but not well. And I think we have to recognize that at our local level and at our federal level. So I'm sorry that I uh, uh, missed that. And the second was the question about the, uh, nonprofits and their ability to do their work uh, and how do they get the funding uh, for that. So in essence, it was how you can go to scale is the way I took it, or go, go to all those uh, in need. And I would say that that's, not, that's something we have not done well. We always recognize there is need. But I believe supportive housing was what she specifically uh, uh, commented on, or service-enriched housing. There is a pretty robust evidence base on how effective that is for families, how effective it is for people uh, dealing with addiction, with domestic violence, with uh, re-entry from uh, 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 jails, uh, on and on. It is an example, though, of where we have um, done the demonstrations, proven the effectiveness, and then not harnessed it as, uh, as a nation. It's not the, her, her, your specific area is not the only one, but is in fact one of the uh, the best examples uh, of it. We've done some work in Minneapolis to show that the families that are need and are helped by these services are ones that are in other social service areas. So it actually saves the city, the state as well, money, but they're all independent funding streams. And so there is the issue in, uh, in finance, they call it the wrong pocket issue. Um, and if we don't begin to think together and to work together as a society, we'll never overcome uh, that. But the area you're working in is one of the ones where the science is pretty uh, good about its uh, value. Thank you. Yes? Hi. My name is uh, Robert Bowling, and I'm uh, running a nonprofit called Child Savers that deals in mental health issues and child development. And I'm, I'm fascinated and appreciate your comments uh, about the impact of the social determinants for, for health. But I, I wonder, you didn't talk specifically about this, if the real question is around income and the impact of income, has uh, Robert Wood Johnson or other foundations looked at the impact of employment and a living wage for families um, to improve health? So we haven't looked at that directly. Um, but it was one of the elements that the National Academy of Medicine singled out as a social determinant to be addressed. They talked about employ they talked about education, they talked about income, they talked about employment, they talked about housing, they added transportation, they talked about race, um, but they very specifically called out employment. In their discussion, they talked about living wage and elevated uh, minimum wage and, uh, and things uh, like that. Um, we've not done uh, direct work in that area. We're, um, one of the things we are looking at, as you know and people here, many of the social services the, are in essence ways to mitigate the effects of poverty, whether that is um, Medicaid, uh, whether that's the earned income tax credit for those that are low, uh, low earners. Uh, all of these are helpful, but they're also unstable. So if you're in a family that relies on those, you can't plan the way people who have a regular uh, income and know you can make uh, ends meet. And, uh, they're, and so the notion of employment is not just employment, but it is steady employment, employment that is, uh, can uh, uh, sustain a family.
Thank you. I know you'll each join me in thanking Dr. Marks for his time and all of his um, wisdom. You've given us quite a great deal to absorb this evening, and I can tell you that Richmond is ready to take your message and to act on it. You've galvanized us and strengthened our resolve to carry out our mission in pursuit of an equitable and healthy Richmond region. We have a big job ahead of us, but this gathering demonstrates our commitment. We're here this evening because we recognize our duty to walk together and work together to make this beautiful region an even better and healthier place to live. And I'm personally very excited, especially hearing about the great experiences that Robert Wood Johnson has um, had in transforming itself to think about health differently and to have a culture of health and tackling equity, which is a, a big task and a big lift. So I know that Richmond can take this on and to do it well and to do as Drs. Avula and Constantine and Mayor Stoney have said, um, to work across disciplines to give every child and every Richmonder uh, a chance at a great life. Um, we know that you'd be welcome in any city, and so we thank you for coming to Richmond, and we thank you for leading the way for us and for your personal support. And so now I invite each of you to join us next door at Amuse for a reception. So please enjoy the rest of your evening, and thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you.